Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, Richard, do I need to turn this on, or is it already on? Do I do I need to turn on this little microphone up here of yours? It's on. It's just okay. Sorry, that's a a technical issue that uh, sometimes comes up. But it's good to be here on the Lord's Day, and it's I'm thankful that all of you are here. Just a few announcements. We received a thank you uh, this week from Hands of Mercy Food Bank, where we've uh, made a financial contribution of uh, $1,181 to them, and thank you for your generosity in that regard. And there's a lot of food over there that we haven't been able to take, where you all have made contributions. Uh, They've been closed due to weather and holidays, and so if you go next to the hallway and beside my office, there's a quite an abundance of groceries there, and thank you for that. Uh, remember that Pray and Go meets today following morning worship, and uh, 466 homes, more or less, it's probably on the last side, we've had some confusion about our numbers there, I've been told yesterday, but uh, that's still a lot of homes, I know it's well over 400. Choir this afternoon at 5.30, followed by Bible study at 6.30, the session meets for the first time on Tuesday evening at 6.30, and then uh, Kids for Jesus, Fellowship Meal, and Bible Study, all at 6 o'clock on Wednesday, and then Bible Study begins on January the 18th, the Ladies' Bible Study at 10 a.m. There's a lot to spit out. With that, in that regard, are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? All right, if not, catechism question is what does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? The ninth is that we do not deceive and 10th that we are content not envying anyone. And you can look at James 2.8 in regard to that uh, catechism question. And now, uh, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's... That is a blessing. Amen. That is the definitely passing the joy and peace of Christ. Uh, before we come into the Lord's presence, it is good and right that we as sinful people confess our sins to the Lord, who is a holy God. Jesus tells us in the Gospels, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let us now pray together and confess our sin to God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Amen. The scriptures proclaim to us that as far as the east is from the west, so far has Christ removed our sins from us. Thanks be to God. Let's stand together and join in our call to worship. You can find it in your bulletin or you may use the screen. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. 
For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Gracious God, you are good, you are mighty, and you are holy. And we come and we bow down before you now to adore and magnify your precious name. It is in that name we pray. Amen. And let's remain standing for our praise chorus. This morning it's number 419, Family of God. Number 82, praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. What is it that we believe? Let us now recite the Apostles' Creed and cite what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
may be seated. And our next hymn I know is one of your favorites. It's number 508, Love Lifted Me. Projectors go out. Remember, there is a backup in the pew in front of you, the old-fashioned book. Uh, I just noticed that. Anyway, I'm sure it's going to be all right. Um, the noisy offering this month is for Project Lifesaver. If you remember last week, I explained that to you. Lifesaver is a project where a GPS locator bracelet is put on an older person or on a special needs child and if that person is lost, uh, if they have that bracelet, they're usually found within 30 minutes. If they don't uh, have that bracelet, I can't remember the exact time, it's 12 to 24 hours or longer. In other words, the Lifesaver bracelet uh, actually does save their lives. So that's what our noisy offering goes to this month. Uh, the cans for the noisy offering are in the back of the church as well as the offering plates are. And the scriptures clearly tell us to bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So that is the Lord's word for us this morning. It's time now for a prayer request and praise reports. Remember, these prayer requests that have been lifted up during the week and during the Sunday school hour, uh, remember Eulene Brock, those of you who went on the Pineville Mission trip when we were helped building the mission up there in Pineville, Kentucky, you'll remember Eulene who worked in the kitchen. Uh, she's in the hospital with COVID right now and she's not doing very well, so remember Eulene and her family. Uh, remember the family of Melvin Page and his passing. Melvin is... Jessica Allred's uncle, and he recently passed away. 
Also be in prayer for Ron Crabtree. Uh, Ron had a heart attack on Thursday and was in the hospital there for a couple of days, but he came home yesterday afternoon and he's home recovering. So remember Ron and Sheila. Also be in prayer for uh, Betty McCauley. Betty is, uh, is not feeling very well at all this morning. Uh, so remember her in your prayers. Are there anyone, is there anyone else that we need to be praying for this morning? Any other prayer requests? Ms. Jennifer. Um, Kennedy Ladd, she is a, Colby's girlfriend's cousin, and she's just, they've become really great friends of ours. She's, um, she is in Minnesota right now. She has a syndrome called Hurler's Syndrome. Her and her brother both have this. Um, but she is having back surgery on Thursday, and it's a, a, an invasive, difficult surgery. So they have left her brother here with friends and family. So his name is Lincoln. Um, Mom's name is Ryan and Allie. So they need just our prayers, and she needs our prayers. They'll be up there for two weeks, um, and then come home, and she'll still recover here. But they're going to do something to her back. So let's remember Kennedy, Ladd, and the whole family in our prayers. Anyone else? Everett? Uh, Uncle Melvin was sick. Yes, we'll pray for Uncle Melvin. Thank you, Everett. Anyone else? All right, let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, we come before you this morning and we just praise you and thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that we can come into your presence and sing our praises and lift up our prayer requests and just adore your great and holy name. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that, that we can come and confess our sins to you and that you, through your son, Jesus Christ, cleanse us from all of our sins and from all of our unrighteousness. So, Lord, we thank you and praise you for that. And now, Lord, um, you have proclaimed to us that we are to come before you and lift up our prayer requests to you. And so, Lord, that is what we do now. You have told us to ask and to seek and to knock, and that's what we are doing at this moment. Father, we lift up these prayer requests to you. Uh, we... Uh, Eulene Brock, we just pray for the, her healing and for her family and for all of those who are caring for her. Lord, just uh, thank you for her service to you and her love for you and for your people and how often she has reached out in your name to proclaim your gospel through her acts of service. So we just pray for her, her now. And we pray for Melvin Page and his, and his family as he has passed away and just bring your comfort your peace, and your grace to the Page family just now. And Lord, we lift up to you, Ron, and we praise you, Father, that uh, he is home from the hospital after suffering this heart attack. We pray for him and Sheila as he recovers. And we pray for Betty this morning, Lord, that you would heal her body and help her to recover as well. And Father, we especially want, we want to lift up Kennedy Ladd, who's going to be having surgery this coming Thursday, and just guide the hands of the surgeon that might bring healing to her body and be with her, whole, her entire family as she is in, uh, out of state to have this surgery, and they are here. And Father, they're in two different places, but we know that you are God who is everywhere, that you have never left us or forsaken us, and that you're with each person in this situation. And Lord, just now we want to pray for all of the churches here in Kingston, here in the state of Tennessee and the United States and around the world, that they would be faithful to proclaim your gospel, that they would uh, bring that message of your salvation and of your grace, that they would proclaim the truth of your word. And now, Lord, we pray that we as your people would be filled with the knowledge of your will. Lord, we ask that you give us wisdom and understanding that can only come from you. We ask that you would fill our lives in a way 
that uh, would bring glory to your name. Help us to bear the fruits of love and joy and peace and kindness, patience, and understanding in our lives. Lord, help us to increase in our love for you. Strengthen us with your mighty power. And may we live our lives in thanksgiving to you and to you alone. And now, gracious God, we close this prayer with the prayer that your precious and holy Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
story, the message of the gospel. It is an old, old story, but it's that old story that transforms us and makes us new in His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, we've taken a long break from Hebrews, and either you're looking forward to getting back or into Hebrews, I know I was, or, or not, but the Lord has brought us here. So if you have the Bible, let's turn to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews chapter 9, be looking at verses 15 through 28 this morning. Hebrews 9, and I'll begin reading in verse 15. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. and Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into, a holy pla- in, into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself up repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Short prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you now, and we ask that uh, what, what we know not, that you would teach us, what we have not, that you would give us, and what we are not, Father, that you would make us. In your name we pray, amen. Since it's been uh, a minute or two since we've looked at Hebrews, uh, I think it's a good thing to uh, do a quick review because verse 15 says, starts with therefore, and as you probably know, whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to look at the verses preceding to know what the therefore is therefore, right? And just context, in other words, is key. It's key. The writer to the Hebrews has been explaining to us that the Old Testament sacrifices, they're temporary. That the high priest on the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, would enter into the most holy place with the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. First he would sacrifice for himself, ask forgiveness for his sins, and then he would make a sacrifice and enter into the Holy of Holies and seek the forgiveness of the sins of the people. And he had to do this year after year after year because the sacrifices of the Old Testament could not, if you have your Bible open, you can see this in verse 9, could not perfect the conscience of the worshiper. That's what the Bible tells us. In other words, no matter how many times the priest made a sacrifice, no matter how many times you would come to worship and seek forgiveness, you still had that guilty conscience. You still had the guilt of your sin upon you because, you know, by the time lunch was over, that temporary forgiveness was gone. And it wasn't long before it it was over and you were still 
hauling around that wheelbarrow load of your guilt and your sin. If you ever pushed a wheelbarrow, you know how hard that is. I used to do that. For, anyway, that's a whole other thing that just came to my mind. I shouldn't say everything that comes to my mind up here. So, but anyway, you push that around. And it says there, but when Christ appeared, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by the means of, of, cal- of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood. And when he did, he secured an eternal Redemption, that's verses 11 and 12. In other words, Christ went in to a better place. The temple down here, the tabernacle down here was just a copy, a copy, a faint copy of what is going on in heaven. And the high priest would enter into that faint copy. But Jesus is the high priest, the high priest, and he entered into heaven itself and he offered a better sacrifice He offered his own self, which means that the forgiveness and the cleansing that Christ provides is not not, uh, temporary, it is eternal. That's what it says here. It's an eternal redemption. So now, because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, you don't have to push that wheelbarrow around anymore. You don't have to carry your guilt anymore. Like we said at the beginning, when we confessed our sins, Jesus says, my burden is easy. My, 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 my yoke is light, and that is why. So, therefore, that's verse 15. I told you just a brief review, so we're there now. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Now, what's a mediator? A mediator is just a go-between. Jesus is the bridge between sinful people like us and a holy God. Jesus, by his death upon the cross, became that go-between. He became that bridge between God and sinful men and women. Remember, the scriptures clearly teach that the soul that sins shall die. And how many of us sin? We all do. Every one of us. And the only way that anyone can ever stand before God is if their sins have been paid for. And you can either pay for them yourself or you can pay, you can seek payment through Christ, and the payment for sin is death. That is the payment for sin. Jesus died, and he paid for sin, and he opened the way, and his death was that payment, and through that death, he became that bridge, he became that mediator between God and man. He is the way. Jesus himself said, I am the way in John 14. That's, that's the first. Next, we see that Jesus' death has not only made him a mediator, But it also set a will in motion, a will. Verse 15, it talks about a promised eternal inheritance, an inheritance, an eternal inheritance. Then it picks it up in verses 16 and 17. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is still alive. If there's a will, and the person who writes it, the will, they have to be dead, don't they? Or the will cannot be executed as long as they live. As long as they live, you cannot uh, receive or collect the inheritance. There have been a lot of movies made like that, haven't there? You know, the guy's still alive, the lady's still alive, millionaire, we got to get rid of them to collect the will. So there has to be a death. That's the simple point. The simple point of these of this verse, a will cannot be executed until the one who wrote it dies. Now the Greek word translated as will here in the ESV means this, somebody makes the rules up here and you can either take it or leave it. You know, somebody makes up the rules in this will, in this covenant, and you can either take it or leave it. In other words, what the scripture is talking about here, this is not an agreement between equals. The writer is talking about God's covenant, and God always makes the rules. And we can either take them or we can leave them. There's no bargaining with God. There is no highway option. God doesn't say, uh, it's my way or the highway. He doesn't say that. God says, it's my way, and there is no other way. That's what he says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes into the, comes to the Father except through me. There's no bargaining with God. Uh, the Bible knows nothing of, well, you know, Lord, I'll do this if you do that. 
God, if you adjust your word, if you adjust your covenant here just a little bit, then I'll do this and, you know, we, we, can, we can work this out. God's truth, God's word is absolute. And the writer to the Hebrews illustrates it with a will because a will is not a bargain between two people. A will is made out by one person and the other person either takes it or leaves it. And I know these days, you know, somebody dies, well, I'm going to go contest the will, I'm going to go down here to the courthouse, we're going to go to a judge, etc., etc., etc. Who are you dealing with here? We're dealing with God. There, you know, there's no contesting God's word. And God has promised to his people an eternal inheritance, an inheritance that depends upon the death of the one who made the will in order for that inheritance to be received. That's plain and that's simple. That's all that's being said is the will cannot function until somebody dies. So what does God do? He comes to this world and he dies. He dies. Jesus had to die to ensure and to secure the eternal inheritance of his people. The kingdom of heaven is bequeathed to all believers. Such is God's will and God's testament, and Jesus' death released, uh, released it to our possession. Some of it's ours right now, but we will receive it in its fullness when he returns or when we go to be with him. Okay, so, so far we've seen that Jesus' death makes him a mediator of that new covenant. His death made our eternal inheritance a reality. And then in verses 18 through 22, we, we discover another reason for Christ's death, and that is that forgiveness demands blood. Forgiveness demands blood. None of this is possible without blood. That's what the writer is saying. And if you read your Old Testament, you can find all of this. The issue of blood being shed and the sacrifices, that's the emphasis of what the writer is saying. And he plainly says it in verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And we need to understand something here. We need to understand that blood is symbolic of death. I had a professor in seminary, uh, she said how gory and awful was the hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood. She said, what is this, people swimming in a fountain, who wants to be bathed in blood, that's nasty, that's unsanitary, and I remember sitting in that class, I can't remember everything she said, but... I knew that she was questioning the necessity of the atoning death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She was taking the word blood literally. She was taking it literally when it was clear that it was meant to be understood symbolically. Symbolically. The writer is clear. Blood is symbolic of death. Verses 19 and 20, he talks about the blood of calves and goats and of how Moses sprinkled the, the, their blood on the altar and on the people. In other words, the first covenant was initiated with blood, with the death of those animals. That's how it happened. And, and on the night before Jesus' death, he sat with the disciples, and what did he do? He picked up the cup, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus didn't cut himself and bleed into the cup. He didn't do that. He didn't cut himself and bleed into the cup and ask them all to drink his blood. The wine in the cup was symbolic. Symbolic uh, th that he was going to shed his blood in death upon the cross. And Jesus established the new covenant through his blood with the giving of his life on the cross. See, it was not Jesus' physical blood that saves us. It's not. If that were true, all he needed to do was come down here and cut his finger. Why go through everything he did if it was just the blood? It was dying, suffering, living in our place, which is symbolized by the shedding of his physical blood that makes our eternal inheritance possible. The purpose of the blood was to symbolize the sacrifice for sin, which has brought cleansing from sin. Therefore, the writer tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 
And the Old Testament says the same thing, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. That's what the life does. That's what the blood does, the giving of life. It makes atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. In other words, the penalty for sin is death, nothing but death symbolized by the shedding of blood. Nothing but that can forgive and atone and set aside your sin. You can't enter into God's presence by being good. You can't enter into God's presence by being an outstanding citizen. You can't enter into God's presence by going through religious rituals and ceremonies. You can't enter into his presence by reading the Bible more or by going to church more or by uh, being a good church member or by thinking sweet, sweet thoughts about Jesus. You only enter into God's presence and participate in the new covenant. The only way is by the death of Jesus Christ and by grace through faith and belief in his shed blood on the cross on your behalf. That's the only way. That is the only access. God set the rules. The soul that sins, it shall die. And then what does God do? In grace, he moves right in and he provides a death substitute. The death of his son, Jesus Christ, is the only thing that satisfies God because he requires death. And all over the New Testament, or excuse me, all over the Old Testament, blood was spilled. Blood was spl splattered everywhere so that those people would know that the innocent, the innocent sacrifice of that animal was the only thing that would provide forgiveness and the, in the innocent sacrifice for the guilty. And that's who Christ is. He is the innocent, blameless Son of God sacrificed for guilty sinners. And forgiveness is a costly, costly thing. It's a costly thing. And I think about how lightly we take forgiveness. Or maybe I should say how lightly I take forgiveness sometimes. I mean, I come to the end of the day, put my head on the pillow, say, God, I did this today. And I usually try to go through the day and you know, just basically confess my sins because you know what? He knows all about them anyway. There's no need in trying to hide them. He knows. And I go through these things that I think weren't pleasing to him. And I thank him for his forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm asleep. You can ask my wife in a couple of minutes. She gets jealous of that. I just go, I go to sleep pretty fast. And then I go and I sit in my desk and I study the word of God and see how much it costs. How much it costs to purchase my forgiveness and then how lightly or glibly I treat it. The infinite cost of God in sending His Son to forgive sins. But I'm so ready to sin. Why? Well, He's going to forgive it. And then what is that? That is presumption. That is an abuse of the sweet, sweet grace of our Lord and Savior. I think that's why Paul at the start of Romans 6 says, shall we sin that grace may abound? And then he throws his hands up in the air and he says, may it never be. God forbid. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Would we stomp all over the grace of God? Consider the cost of your forgiveness, beloved. And God is, is bound. We, we think about, you know, we think, well, nothing holds God. Nothing does. Yeah, it does. God is bound. He's bound by his character. He's bound by who he is. He cannot break his moral laws. He cannot violate the moral laws of the universe because he's built them into the universe, and he's built into the universe the fact that sin demands death. And so finally, he's the one who paid the price. He paid it with his son. You see, forgiveness isn't just God saying, you know, I like you, you're a good person, I've known you all your life, it's okay, I'll just let it go. No, it's a costly thing, a costly thing. Without bloodshed, there is no forgiveness of sin. If you're forgiven, it's because somebody died. 
And then I ask myself, you know, what's it cost me to forgive somebody? Do I even come close to paying the price that God paid to forgive me? And I think, well, I can't forgive them. It's just too much. Really? Really? We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Verses 23 and 24, the writer speaks of the necessity for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. And that's just bumping us back up. The, the words, these rites, bump us back up to verses 18 through 22 and the sprinkling of the blood on that copy of the, of the heavenly tabernacle. And he goes on to point out that Christ has entered where? Into heaven itself. He is at this very moment at this very moment, in the presence of God. And why is he there? Why is he in the presence of God? It says here that he's in the presence of God on your behalf, on my behalf. He's up there interceding for you. He's up there interceding for me. He's praying for us right now. That's amazing, isn't it? That God is praying for us interceding for us, that we might love Him and live for Him each and every moment. That's what's going on. And then in verses 25 and 26, we find a blessed truth. We find a wonderful truth in Scripture. In the Old Covenant, the priest had to offer sacrifices repeatedly. And they offered them repeatedly because they were not sufficient to cleanse the conscience and the sins of of the people. And in these verses we discover that Christ didn't enter into the presence of God to offer himself repeatedly. No, he didn't do that. As the high priest enters into the holy places every year with blood not his own. The high priest went in every year. Jesus did not enter in that way. It says he, Jesus, if that's what was going on, he would have had to enter and suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. If that's what's happening, you have to go in over and over again. But as it is, he, as, as it is, Jesus has appeared how many times? Once for all at the end of the ages to do what? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In other words, the death of Jesus is a once for all, unrepeatable sacrifice for sins. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, guess what? It was finished. It was done. Our forgiveness is complete. The sins of our past, the sins of our present, the sins of our future are covered under the blood of Christ, completely and totally forgiven in that all-sufficient one-time sacrifice upon the cross. So, We've seen about the death of Jesus, that it made him our mediator, that he's a bridge between us and God. We've seen that his death, he died that we might obtain this eternal inheritance. He died once for all to shed his blood for the, for the forgiveness of our sins by the sacrifice of himself. And now the writer of Hebrews goes from preaching to meddling. Okay? Because he says, and just as it is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes the judgment. We don't like to hear about that, do we? Comes the judgment. Each person within the sound of my voice will die. And this verse tells us that it's by divine appointment. You are appointed to die. And we will all face the judgment. We'll all stand before God and give an account. And we will stand there, if we stand there in our own goodness and in our own power, under our own steam, we're doomed. Sin demands death. You will face an eternal death, an eternal punishment outside of the presence of God. But thanks be to God for the 28th verse. There we read that Christ has been offered once to bear the sins of many. Beloved, Christ has done what he set out to do. He has redeemed his people and that is the reason enough or it is reason enough for you and I to give him glory for all eternity. Our salvation was planned in eternity past by God the Father. It was secured by God the Son and it is applied to us by the Holy Spirit through the wonder of a transformed life as we grow 
in grace to him. It is an eternal redemption, verse 14, an eternal redemption that our consciences are cleansed from dead works to do what? To serve, to serve a living God. In other words, Jesus saved us so that we might always live for Him, that we might always love Him, that we might always grow up in Him, and that we might always serve Him. That's why He saved us. He didn't save us and stick us on a shelf and say, that's it. We're not a can of preserves that the Lord's going to take off the shelf and pop the top on someday. No, it's now. Do you think that Jesus went to all the trouble of redeeming us with His life death and resurrection so that you and I could just turn around and do whatever we please? Do you think that he redeemed us at such a great cost and made us members of his family that we might just ignore him? So that we might offer to him the scraps of our lives, the the leftovers of our time, that we might serve him only when, you know, I've got this warm feeling in my tummy and I just feel this way right now, so I, I'm going to go and favor God with my presence. Beloved, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to serve the living God. By nature, you and I serve ourselves. By nature, we're interested only in ourselves. Sometimes we'll take an interest in our family or our friends or our neighbors and we'll give them some time. But the truth is, at the core of our being, we're selfish. I mean, the Bible tells us this. There's nobody who seeks after God. Not one. Every now and then we have this stirring in our hearts. But is there an ongoing, essential quest for God? No, not apart from him. And so what do we do? We look back, we look back over our shoulder and we look down the corridors of time and all we can do is marvel at the redeeming love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that from all eternity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you know what they did? They even entered into a covenant and it was a covenant of redemption. It was a covenant in which they planned to redeem a people that belonged exclusively to the Lord, a people who would be given up in service to Him. And down through the corridor of times, what did He do? He came. He sought us. He bought us. And He has secured us at a great price. And He's, he's made us His own. How wonderful is that? How great is that? He's made us His own. And the most significant thing about all of this is that in His grace and in His mercies, he, he looks and He says, she's mine. I chose her from all eternity. I've loved her with an everlasting love. And it's not, it's not that, the, that nothing in her that made her redeemable. It's not anything in Him that makes Him worthy. I wasn't struck by how, how smart they were or how good-looking they were. No, I just reached down, and I picked them. I loved them. I gave my son for them. Now, there's another sermon here, and you look at your watch and say, gosh, I hope he doesn't preach it. <laughs> well, you know, I won't. Don't worry. I won't, but you know what? This will preach. I think it will anyway. You know, here's the outline. You can go preach it to somebody if you want to. Here's the outline. Verse 26, you'll notice he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's point number one. He has appeared. Talk about his incarnation, about his coming, about the fact that he arrived. And we just did that during Advent at Christmas. That's what we did. Here's your second point, verse 24. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. He has appeared, he now appears, and then he will appear. Verse 28, he will appear a second time. He has appeared and made atonement for my sin. He appears before the Father and He pleads my case. All of my rebellion, all of my impure thoughts, all of my wandering, all of my disinterest in His Word and in His truth. He's there. He's pleading for me. He's praying for me. He's interceding for me. And best of all, He's coming back. 
That's what he says. He will reappear. And when he comes back this second time, he's not going to come to deal with the issue of sin. He's coming for those who anticipate his arrival, for those who love his appearing, for those who, under, who have understood the wonder of the fact that he has appeared, and for those who daily live in the wonderful experience of the fact that He is interceding for me, He is loving me, and I can grow in Him, and the Father is ministering to me right now. I'm walking in this relationship with Him. Only those people will be looking forward to His coming and appearing again. What a difference it makes when Jesus comes. What a difference it makes. That lady who was by the well, she'd been to the well Tons and tons of times. But when Jesus came, it was different. Zacchaeus thought it was just an ordinary day with an extraordinary opportunity to climb up a tree and get a weird point of view. And then Jesus came. And it was different. It was all different. Each of the disciples thought it was just another day. Going to do a little fishing. And then Jesus came. And he called their name. Jesus, down through the ages, has come. And he sought us. He's bought us. And he secured us at a great price. And he's made us his very own. How about you? Has Jesus come to you? I'm not asking you if you've been feeling religious lately. I'm not asking you if you went through a confirmation class. I'm not asking you if you have sort of drifted into the kingdom of God. I'm not asking you if you slipped up your hand or if you've walked down an aisle. I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you, can you look to a point in your life when Jesus came? Can you do that? Let us pray. At this moment right where you are, right where you're sitting. Tell God your response to His Word this morning. Some of us have been living for ourselves. We've been neglecting the fact that we've been redeemed with the lifeblood of the Son of God. We've forgotten the high price that was paid for our salvation. Others of us, Lord, don't know you, and we cry out to you for the forgiveness that only you provide. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Closing hymn is uh, Have Thine Eye Way. Number, what number is that? 591. He is the potter, we the clay. Ask Him to mold us, shape us, and make us after His will. That's what the Spirit does. As you live for Him, I guarantee you, you probably sin. If you're like me, you'll probably sin before I get to the end of the aisle down there. God will forgive you, and He'll use it to mold you and shape you. And I promise not to preach two sermons. So let's stand and sing number 591, Have Thine Own Way. Verses 1 and 4. Verses 1 and 4. Thank you, Beth. <laughs>
Lord, that is our prayer, what we have just sung. Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit so that others would see your son, Jesus Christ, and him alone living in us, that others might be drawn to, to him and experience the power and the redemption of the gospel. It is through him that we come to you now. And now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.